About this time there grew up two major centers of power in the Roman Empire. This is the city of Rome and the western Mediterranean, and this is the city of Constantinople, named for Emperor Constantine, in the area of the Bosphorus, which is the area separating the rest of the Mediterranean from the Black Sea. This is traditionally regarded as the gateway to Asia, and all of this area is referred to in many historical periods as the Orient, although we tend to see just China and Japan and perhaps some of these nations here as the Orient, but all of this area of Asia was called the Orient, and this was called the West here. When Rome fell, the end of the 500s, the remnant of the Roman government situated itself in Constantinople. The division here between Rome and the East, eventually this became known as Byzantium, and this was the Roman Empire. So this line more or less dividing that. And we'll see later on that this area to the East eventually splits off from the church in the West, and to the East this becomes the Greek Orthodox, and to the West, with the Pope centered in Rome, becomes the Roman Catholic Church. The Bishop of Rome assumed greater powers as the years went on, and eventually became the office of the Pope. The ideas of how images should be used in church differed significantly between these two areas. Although in the years immediately following the fall of Rome, this edict that simple images are okay in churches to tell a religious story held sway in both places. But in the East, there arose a powerful notion that images should not be in church at all, because there was a great danger as pagans were being converted to Christianity that they would mistake the images for deities themselves. Uh, much of pagan religion centers on idols or deities that people create and worship. And the fear was that if you introduced images, either flat images like paintings or sculpture into a church, these people who recently had been worshiping idols would continue the practice just thinking that these are the idols that you've provided to replace the ones that they formerly worshipped. So the people who felt that no images of any religious nature should be tolerated in a church were called iconoclasts. And this battle raged from around the 500s to into the 700s in the former Roman Empire. Eventually, in both ends of the empire, the iconoclasts lost out, and images are present in churches in both ends of the former Roman Empire. The style of these images, however, differs. In the Byzantine Empire, that is centered on Constantinople, they inherited a lot of artistic conceptions from the Greeks, and here you see an evidence of that. This is an icon, tempera, which is pigment mixed with egg yolk or egg white, and in this case painted on wood. Here we see the Virgin Mary, the baby Jesus, kind of a typical pose of Jesus sitting on his mother's knee, and some sort of a circular throne here. Notice that the way that the folds of the cloth around the limbs of the body are represented is very reminiscent of the type of folds represented in Greek sculpture and probably in Greek painting as well. And the folds of the cloth here, gold being used to highlight, in this case red, similar to purple as a color of royalty. In fact, icons, despite the idea that images should not be worshipped, began to hold a special place in the Eastern Church, not so much in the Western Church. Here we have, once again, the influences of the Eastern Church, but more generally speaking, the idea that church walls were decorated with pictures of people, people prominent in the religion. Here we have Mary and the baby Jesus. We have here very prominently Jesus looking down on everybody present. And then we have a number of holy figures, perhaps the apostles regarded now as saints, and perhaps other local historical religious figures who are regarded as saints, people who in death are 
close to the deity. So somebody who might act as an intercessor between the people still alive and here present in the church and with Jesus and God. So praying to the saints, worshiping the saints in, in a way by immortalizing them with figures in churches became quite a common practice. And here we see some angels, also with human faces. A goldish coloring here in the background, a rich gold coloring, recognizing that the church is a very special place. In fact, in medieval times, of course, it was probably the fanciest and the most colorful place that anybody would ever see, because architecture for other buildings was rather plain and drab and functional, and coloration in the area outside the church was really limited to whatever was provided by natural growth, trees and flowers and such, coming and going in season. As a man-made creation, a church was probably fancier and much more decorated than anything else a human being would see. Here's just a close-up of that area that I had mentioned earlier, and you can see a little bit more about the figures being used to decorate the walls of the church. Many times what they're doing is indicative of who they are. Holding a book like this might be Moses, and holding here some object might be one of the apostles, and acting out one of the biblical stories. Chapter 6 ends up with Gombrich including a little piece of end art, in this case from a manuscript, an illustration, and later on we'll start talking about manuscripts as being illuminated with pictures like this. Now I've doctored this up just a little bit in order to try and make it more plain what was happening here. This is not necessarily a piece of anything more than slightly decorative art. What's happening here is that this is an iconoclast, a person who feels that images do not belong in church, and he's got some sort of a long brush here in a pot of paint, and this is some image that he's painting over on the church wall. So it's just a little reminder of Gombrich that that was occurring in this era, this tension between people who felt that churches should not have any kind of decoration involving human figures, and the prevailing sentiment that overwhelmed that, that churches should definitely have decoration, including human figures, but only for the purpose of telling religious stories in as simple a way as possible. So keep that in mind. The artistry didn't matter. In fact, artistry was pretty much to be frowned upon. We didn't want these images to become something in and of themselves to be admired. They simply had to be functional to describe a story. Now what we'll see happens as a historical trend is that images do in fact become more and more artful. It seems that artistic creativity just can't be contained. But for many, many hundreds of years the edict was followed fairly rigorously that artists could not create images any fancier than they had to be, any more realistic than they had to be, in order to convey a religious story as simply as possible. And that's the end of the discussion for chapter 6.